Our topic today is on blockchain-driven transformation. I'm Tairu Hassan, the director of Brightline Initiative. And for those of you who don't know, Brightline is a project management institute initiative dedicated to helping organizations bridge the gap between strategy design and strategy delivery. I'm joined today by Anthony Williams and Emil Anderson. Anthony is co-founder and president of the Deep Center. He is co-author with Don Tapscott of the groundbreaking bestseller, Wikinomics, How Mass Collaboration Change Everything, and its sequel, Macro Wikinomics, New Solution for a Connected Planet. His work on technology and innovation has appeared in such publications as the Huffington Post, Have a Business Review, and the Global Mail. Emil is a consultant and practitioner in the field of business strategy and transformation and has been involved in over four global strategic projects. At the Brightline Initiative, Emil is responsible for several projects and support in professional research and capacity building. He has a strong interest in disruptive technologies and how organizations create and deliver value. Now back to our topic today. As you may know, distributed ledger technologies may have changed the enterprise forever. As distributive technologies such as blockchain, AI, and Internet of Things, and even machine learning drive profound change in the social and economic landscape, savvy enterprise leaders continuously try to reinvent and transform how they conduct the core business because staying still, still is not an option. At the same time, while adoption of blockchain is still in the early phase, the technology has the potential to transform how we do business. In the discussion today, we look at how leaders can make change to people, processes, to make adoption of blockchain a success. Now, how would we, would we go about it? First, we'll have a short presentation by Anthony, where he will summarize the key, the key findings of the research Brightline and the Blockchain Research Institute has done together. And then we will move to a more interactive path, where we'll be taking questions from you and then uh, having a great discussion here. Anthony, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we've been working for many years together on these issues surrounding blockchain, so I thought it would be useful um, for those perhaps who have not been steeped in blockchain technology to have a little bit of an overview, first of all, about the fundamental technologies, and then we can talk after we've set a bit of a baseline about how those blockchain technologies are enabling some pretty profound changes, both in at the enterprise level, but also at the entire sector and industry level as well. So that's the gist of the presentation. Um, we'll start with uh, slide number one, which is the internet of information. I think it's, it's useful to kind of step back and almost compare and contrast the first generation of the internet with the next generation of the internet that we see unfolding today. So with the first generation, you know, the internet was really about the publication and distribution of information and documents. And when you're sending an email or a Word document, a PDF or a PowerPoint presentation to someone uh, using the internet, you're sending a copy of that document, not necessarily the original. And with this internet of information, we essentially had a, a printing press for information at our disposal. And that works really well for digitized information. But what we've seen in the past decade is that increasingly complex services, processes, transactions are starting to move online. And that requires an entirely different type of internet-based. And we're seeing the internet itself begin to evolve with technologies like blockchain. So if we go to the second slide, um, what we're starting to see is what we describe as a, a, the Internet of value. Essentially, when it comes to assets like money, stocks, bonds, loyalty points, intellectual property, patents, you know, a music recording, even things like votes. 
sending a copy of those assets is not a good idea. You know, it's okay for people to print a copy of a PowerPoint presentation, but you certainly don't want them to print money, for instance. So if I give you $100, it's important that I no longer possess $100 and that I can't send that same money to someone else. So this is something that cryptographers have, uh, cryptographers, sorry, have called the double payment problem. And it's something that blockchain is actually really good at solving. So if we go to the next slide um, about the middlemen. Uh, so this is slide, uh, slide four in the PowerPoint presentation. How have we dealt with this double payment problem in the past? <clears throat> well, for the most part, we've relied entirely on middlemen to do the intermediary uh, sort of authentication of identities and establishing trust between two parties. And typical intermediaries include banks, governments, companies like Uber and Apple and so forth. These companies have been entrusted with maintaining the transaction records and essentially performing the business processes that underlie you know, all of this virtual commerce. And you could argue that uh, on some levels, they do quite a good job of this, but there are some limitations and problems, and those problems are becoming more and more evident today. So for instance, you know, big banks and even governments rely on centralized servers, and those centralized servers can be hacked, and we've seen so many examples of this recently. Uh, the intermediaries and middlemen, they also tend to take a, a piece of the value for performing this service. So they take a cut of the transaction costs, if you will. And in a case like sending international remittances, that uh, transaction cost can be as much as 10% of the economic value of the transaction. Uh, the third problem is that increasingly these digital intermediaries, they capture our data and they undermine our privacy. And perhaps most problematic, we've seen digital intermediaries like Facebook actually hold a lot of power. So there's a pretty strong argument for disintermediating some of these intermediaries, and that essentially is what blockchain can do. So if we go to the next slide on the trust protocol, um, we have seen with this new internet of value, essentially that we have this new system, a, a, a distributed, highly secure ledger or database where all kinds of different assets from money to music can be stored, moved, exchanged, managed securely and privately without any powerful intermediaries at all. This is essentially what blockchain does. And although blockchain was invented to provide transaction and record keeping infrastructure for Bitcoin, and that's often the association that many people make with blockchain is that it's the enabling infrastructure for for Bitcoin, what we have found through our research is, in fact, that the applications for blockchain are a lot broader than that. They essentially have a, a whole span of different applications across industries and sectors that go well beyond finance. In essence, what we're seeing is that for the first time in human history, two parties anywhere in the world can extract, can transact, exchange value without any intermediaries. And trust, in this case, with the blockchain infrastructure is established not by a powerful intermediary in the center of the transaction who's sort of intermediary into intermediating between two different parties, but essentially the trust is established through online collaboration, cryptography, and clever code. And that's why we call blockchain essentially the trust protocol. So if we go to the next slide, we have a little sort of animation about how all of this works. And it is a bit of a complex process, but we can try to make it a little bit more simple to describe. So we essentially have a, a situation where in a blockchain-based infrastructure, money and other digital assets aren't stored in a central location. They're essentially distributed across this global ledger that uses the highest levels of cryptography to help record and secure individual transactions. So every transaction that is conducted on the blockchain or using blockchain from a purchase uh, or a vote is actually essentially broadcast to the entire network. Now, if we go to the next slide, what we see is that around the world, there's this massive community of contributors that are called miners. Um, it's kind of like gold miners instead of young people. Um, essentially, these are people who have massive computing power resources at their disposal, which are estimated to be somewhere between 10 and 100 times larger than the computer resources at Google's disposal. So it's a massive worldwide network of people with massive computing power who essentially use their computing power to achieve consensus about what is the truth, who paid for what, who owns what, 
who married whom, who voted, essentially securing the individual tra transactions on the blockchain network. Now, if we go to the next uh, sort of phase or slide of the, uh, of the animation, what we see is that every few minutes, like the heartbeat of a network, all of these transactions conducted in that particular period are stored on an individual block. And these miners do a lot of work. Uh, essentially what they do is they compete to solve really tough mathematical problems. And this creates a summary or digest of what has occurred. And then the winning miners who solve these problems are rewarded with digital money like Bitcoin. So to kind of distill it all into one sentence, by solving a mathematical problem, they have successfully mined some Bitcoin. And as a result, added a new block to the blockchain ledger. Now, if we go to the next slide, we can see that essentially you can think about each block of information that records individual transactions as part of a bigger chain. Essentially, each block is added to the ledger and must refer to the preceding block and so forth. And this creates a, a permanent um, timestamp sort of uh, capture of, of the exchanges of value in the network. It prevents people from altering the ledger in the future. Because if you wanted to hack an individual block, say you wanted to try and spend some money twice or, or cast a vote twice in a blockchain-enabled system, you'd have to hack not just that block, but the entire chain. And to hack the chain, you would need to defeat the highest levels of cryptography, not just on one computer, but on millions of individual computers simultaneously. So it's a very secure system for recording and storing information. So if we go to the next slide, the question is, if this can work for recording Bitcoin transactions on a blockchain, why not other types of assets? And this is the, the, the heart of the research that we started to, we've been doing over the years with, uh, with, uh, with Brightline and, and the Blockchain Research Institute. Um, so in the kind of the first uh, wave of thinking about the applications of blockchain beyond Bitcoin, we thought about the ability to record um, all kinds of different assets on a blockchain, not just you know, Bitcoin and economic transactions, but things like land titles, business incorporations, patents, and other assets. And what we find is that the blockchain can actually provide a pretty secure and swift infrastructure for enabling transactions around these kind of assets. So you could take land titles as an example. Um, in countries like India, the whole land title system, the, the system of, of recording ownership of, of land, um, was essentially based on paper-based file storage systems. And there was a lot of uh, concerns around corruption and insecure property rights, which can cause major economic problems in countries in certain parts of the country. So what uh, has been happening recently is they've been implementing implementing blockchain-based systems, and those systems essentially have the ability to store the entire permanent transactional history for a, a given property on the blockchain. This increases the data security. It protects the auth authenticity of the actual land records. It, it provides ultimately a, a better experience for the buyers and sellers of land because they can rely on a very secure infrastructure. They can be certain that you know, the land that they're buying is indeed, you know, owned by the person they're buying it from, from the seller. And this promotes greater confidence in the land administration process and in the broader government. So that uh, is just one example of a kind of using blockchain to register important assets. And a second example, uh, or another kind of extension of the applications of blockchain on the next slide, we look at the ability to not just register or record assets, but also to track the movement of assets through a supply chain. So one of the case studies that we looked at recently, and we'll be publishing this paper uh, with Brightline shortly, it looks at um, the, um, the mining of cobalt and the production of EV batteries uh, in the automotive sector. So just a little bit of background, we found that you know cobalt is a key component in lithium ion batteries. And of course, lithium ion batteries are the batteries that power electric vehicles. And over the years, concerns have been raised about cobalt that's mined in particular from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the Congo or the DRC is where about 70 to 80 percent of the world's cobalt can be found. So it's a critical source of cobalt. But it also is a place where human rights are not universally respected, and there's been a lot of problems reported. So then you have big companies like BMW, Volvo, Volkswagen, and so forth that rely on the cobalt 
from the Congo to produce the electric vehicles are really concerned about, you know, the human rights implications of this cobalt mining. So they want a, the ability to be able to track the cobalt all the way from the mine site right through to the end production of the EV batteries. So how can they do that? Well, they can use the blockchain to essentially provide a really secure, immutable audit trail of that manufacturing extraction and manufacturing process all the way through. Um, so they essentially record each production step on the blockchain. Um, so how does this work? Well, if we go to the next slide, we can see a documentation of the Volkswagen supply chain and they've used blockchain to essentially record this whole complex process. And they're using, um, they're partnering with a, a UK based company called Circular and they've invented this whole series of tools and processes to resolve all of the chain challenges of, of tracing this cobalt production. So this actually includes digitizing the, the cobalt at the actual point of extraction at the mine site. So at the very beginning of the process, uh, then they have a, a way of then tracking those bags of, of cobalt, which are essentially they scan a QR code and then that gets registered onto the blockchain. And then they trace it to the next step, which is the foundry where the cobalt is processed. And then after the cobalt is processed, it goes to the next step where they actually manufacture the cathodes. And then the cathodes go to the next step where they manufacture the cathodes into the EV battery, and then eventually they transferred to the final assembly process at the plant with Volkswagen. So each step of that is recorded on the blockchain and provides this immutable audit trail that companies at Volkswagen can then point to consumers and say, look, you know, we've tracked this whole process from ethical mine sites that aren't abusing human rights, and we can prove that this is how the cobalt has been sort of uh, transformed from its original raw uh, material into this finished EV battery, which goes into the electric vehicle at the end of the day. So that's another really interesting application of blockchain. If we go to the next slide, a, a third area that we've seen an interesting application of, of blockchain is in the automation of project management. And we've seen this even in, in traditionally quite risk averse industries like construction, um, which is you know not an area where you would immediately think of applications for blockchain. But what we're finding is that there are companies like IntelliWave Technologies, which has a whole suite of um, blockchain-enabled project management solutions that are being used by some of North America's biggest construction and infrastructure companies. So essentially what this uh, blockchain-enabled system does, is it takes all of the individual components of the construction projects project and registers it on a blockchain. So you can scan a simple QR code and you can pull up information about building materials, the serial numbers, the photos and specifications, the whole supply chain history, the full quality documentation, all the locations where the materials have been stored. You can even register things like subcontractor agreements, building inspection reports and so on. And this whole digital infrastructure of recording all of this essential information about the construction process and all the materials and, and the agreements and contracts and so forth really helps to automate and speed up the whole project management process. So the white paper that uh, we put together kind of describes how this works in, in, in quite a bit more detail. Um, another interesting application is, is um, and this is on the next slide about streamlining industry workflows, is we see applications where blockchain um, works not just for one individual company, but for a whole collection of, of different organizations that may be working together to exchange knowledge and information across organizational boundaries. And a great example of this is clinical trials. So you can imagine, you know, in, in a clinical trial environment, you've got this situation where you have highly sensitive and private information about people's medical history, which has to be passed between researchers in the pharmaceutical labs, you've got clinicians in the hospital, you have patients who are participating in the trials, and then ultimately you have the regulators who evaluate the end results. So all of these people have to be custodians of, at, at one point in the process of this, you know, highly secure, sensitive, personal uh, medical data. So companies like Sanofi and Pfizer have begun to, to implement blockchain-based systems that, again, can provide a more secure infrastructure for, store, for storing this you know, highly sensitive information. And they feel that, that this could not only guard against the falsification of results, but could also provide this higher level of security that would encourage patients, 
um, you know, hospital administrators and, and ultimately the regulators at the FDA and other similar organizations, you know, to feel a bit more confident about, you know, how this personal health data is being managed. And that over time, you could actually imagine a scenario where using a, a highly secure blockchain environment would allow more of this personal health data to be accumulated in a very secure and private way. And that that then could be amenable to to larger research efforts that would help tackle problems like cancer and, and diabetes. So that's part of the promise of this kind of ability to streamline and, and, and manage highly secure information in a multi-stakeholder environment. And I guess the, um, you know, I wanted to, to wrap up this part of the presentation with a couple of observations around how you could get started exploring the potential to implement blockchain in your enterprise or um, organization. And uh, so this is the next slide on rule number one about identifying a compelling business case. I mean, I think that's really the, the place to start with this is you need to think about, you know, what's the business rationale for this? Where are we going to deploy blockchain in a way that makes sense for our enterprise, for our organization? And I, I just want to kind of remind you of the, the four areas that we point, uh, pointed to in, in the presentation so far. So we've got, on the first hand, we've got projects where you've got um, digital records of importance that have to be carefully audited or protected. And that includes things like digital identities, land titles, contracts, transactions. If these things have to be carefully uh, managed and protected, blockchain could be a good solution for storing that kind of information. The second application is not just recording the asset, but tracking it through the supply chain or trying to, you know, uh, assess the movement of an asset across, you know, through a whole industry ecosystem or supply chain. So that's the second application. And we looked at the instance of Cobalt, but there's lots of other examples of that kind of supply chain traceability with uh, diamonds, uh, everything to food products and so forth have been tracked in this kind of um, fashion using a blockchain based infrastructure. The third application uh, we pointed to was in the construction industry, where you've got the ability to automate the administration of projects by putting all of the materials and contracts and other processes uh, on a blockchain-based infrastructure. You can enable uh, a, a situation where you could actually process a payment to a contractor you know, once the uh, piece of work has been completed using a, a smart contract on the on the blockchain infrastructure and actually speed up and, and automate a lot of those processes that would, uh, I, you know, otherwise be quite cumbersome to, to manage. And then the fourth scenario that we pointed to was these large and complex projects, which, you know, where the success of the project depends on um, actually sending or, or securely managing information across a whole ecosystem of different participants. So we used the clinical trial example as a, as a use case there. I think, that, you know, in each of these scenarios, what we're seeing is that blockchain has enabled an organization or an industry to essentially address a, a very um, uh, important pain point in their respective sector. And that allows them to come with a, a business case for senior management that says, look, you know, blockchain can actually improve data security or it can improve, improve efficiency or it can improve trust and transparency. So they can point to real business benefits to blockchain adoption. So that's the, the first and, and most important rule is to really carefully think through that use case and come up with a compelling business rationale for the investment in, in blockchain. Um, the second rule is to think about and foster organizational agility. So this is important because what we find in, in the adoption of blockchain, you know, regardless of the industry context or scenario that we're talking about, it's often going to require not just changes in technology, but changes in organizational design and strategy and so forth. And it could fundamentally change how entities interact with and manage data and indeed interact with um, other organizations in their ecosystem. So we take the automotive uh, sector as an example. You know, if they're documenting their supply chain in granular detail, well, they're going to have to um, essentially, you know, uh, get comfortable with the level of transparency around how they source critical minerals like cobalt. And the same is true for food producers. You know, if, if they are tracking the supply of, of food products from around the world and all of the ingredients that go into packaged foods and so forth, 
they have to get really comfortable with the implications of dealing with a much more transparent environment and what that means for the integrity of their processes and the quality of their um, manufacturing uh, and so forth. You know, all of that kind of ups the ante on, on uh, transparency. And then the final slide um, is about redefining roles to increase competitive advantage. So, you know, we found in the construction example, for instance, that if you start to automate this whole administrative overhead of materials management and contract management and, and other administrative duties, you know, for the first time, managers on the actual construction site can spend a lot less time on paperwork and start to devote that time instead to problem solving, to boosting productivity, to helping the clients achieve better outcomes and so forth. So it it really, you know, allows um, you to take that kind of administrative layer out of the equation and focus on quality, innovation and productivity. So that's where the competitive advantage comes in. So I'm going to pause there because I know that, um, you know, we've just kind of set a, a bit of a baseline for the uh, for how blockchain works and, and some of the applications that we're seeing in our research. And I think it's, you know, maybe now time for us to have a discussion about that and, and maybe field some questions. Thanks for, uh, for paying attention in that uh, preliminary presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, for, Anthony, for setting the stage here. Really appreciate it. Uh, the, the, the future looks bright. A uh, lot of uh, opportunities, a lot of potentials for organizations to transform themselves uh, through blockchain. But before we move on, maybe, Emil, uh, I mean, you've heard Anthony talking here. Do you have anything you would like to add or share before we go to the Q&A portion? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and thank you, Anthony, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I think, you know, Brightline and, and, and Blockchain Research Institute, we've had a really fruitful and complementary relationship um, throughout the years. Uh, we published like various uh, different types of aspects between strategy transformation and, and blockchain and the you know, integration between those. So it's exciting to have this transformation talk today, finally. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to add some comments to what you said there. Um, uh, and, you know, some people, uh, I mean, most people believe in blockchain as a technology that it will, you know, be very important in the future and some don't. And I think the potential of blockchain is and the ability to capture value is, is clear. Uh, it helps organizations to, to streamline the processes and freeing uh, talent from rep rep repetitive uh, tasks that you, as you talked about, uh, Anthony. Um, so, and I think the doubts of, or, uh, from organizations about using blockchain is slowly uh, fading away. So um, I think it's just a matter of time uh, in the near future here before we see like that the use of blockchain is surpassing this threshold uh, and then you know providing more uh, more use cases uh, where uh, organizations are are not only not only using it but also experimenting and innovating with blockchain. And after that, I mean, I hope that we will see an exponential growth. So um, what I what I like about this year's uh, research with with BRI is that we have uh, been able to pinpoint a few elements uh, that needs to be in place for this uh, blockchain driven transformation, uh, as you talked about, uh, Anthony. Uh, and in addition to identifying use cases and uh, um, of blockchain adoption and creating this business rationale for investing in blockchain, uh, I think it's also striking to think about how much of a people challenge it is to to get going. Um, uh, you see, I mean, doesn't matter what what type of transformation it is, you see resistance everywhere when it comes to to change, uh, and especially if if you're changing the way you work. Um, so having this agile perspective into the organization before you take on blockchain. Uh, can be can be crucial. Uh, it can be proven to to make it much much more easier uh, when when you're adopting and, and using blockchain. Um, and I also think uh, something that we highlighted in the research uh, is uh, the criticality of educating senior executives in a broader sense about blockchain technology and and how it can be adopted. And it might happen in parallel uh, when you create the business uh, rationale in, in the case. Um, but then at the end of the day, it's it's up to the leaders to and the decision makers to 
to you know press the green button and allocate time and resources to to projects like this. So it's it's a critical part of the of the adoption of blockchain in the, in an organization and the ecosystem around the organization. Um, and in the previous um, research uh, that we conducted at, at Brightline, uh, we uncovered a few things related to to leadership uh, and found that leadership is a is a top area uh, that most organizations should focus on and give space in order to uh, deliver strategic transformation projects. Um, and a lot has to do with uh, communication, uh, com communicating a clear vision and goal, and uh, for leaders to personally remain uh, committed to the task at hand and be authentic in the way uh, they communicate this vision through, through the, uh, throughout the lines. Um, so I think it's, I think it's um, very complementary uh, coming back to that between, between Brightline and, and BRI that uh, um, we talk about these softer elements in implementing uh, blockchain as, uh, uh, as it's also very, very important to, uh, to the adoption. Uh, and it's not only about the, the process and the technology itself, but, but rather about the people also. So that, that's just a comment uh, that I wanted to add to, to, uh, to you, Anthony, there. Thank you so much, uh, Emil. Of course, uh, I encourage uh, the participant to uh, write in your questions if you have any, and I will be happy to answer them. There is one that is coming directly from uh, uh, Sven uh, Volker, and um, the question was uh, on the project and blockchain usage. Is, is, is this a positive outlook that we can get rid of uh, recording document on SharePoint and, and into and go into a next layer of professional collaboration storage, which allows for traceability and shared usage. So it is a rather long question, but uh, if I can just summarize it, uh, can we get rid of uh, then the SharePoint document and move in a more collaborative uh, environment and a storage environment where, uh, with uh, the project uh, uh, and blockchain usage that you mentioned, Anthony? Yeah. I. I I mean, it's, I think what we're seeing essentially is, is an environment, whether it's construction, clinical trials, medical research, and so forth, where you've got lots of uh, different entities that have to share information and they have to share information securely. And often, you know, the ability to do that in an inter-organizational environment using a blockchain infrastructure is always going to be a better scenario than trying to email or send documents and have all kinds of issues with version control and so forth, especially when it's, it's really important that information is managed privately and securely, or you can begin to, with blockchain, for instance, utilize the smart contract functionality, which allows you to automate certain processes. So I'd use the example, for instance, of a contractor completing a piece of work that automatically triggers a payment process using a smart contract on the blockchain infrastructure. So there's lots of compelling reasons why you would want to consider moving out of the traditional sort of information management paradigm, which is based on individual siloed organizations and move into this more collaborative infrastructure uh, environment where you can share the information or record it in a secure way using the blockchain infrastructure. So yeah, I think there is that certain possibility and it makes sense in, in these more complex um, environments where you've got lots of organizations that have to collaborate together. Excellent, excellent. Now, now, now maybe uh, if I uh, think about it and when we look at the horizon for blockchain, of course, there is one domain where people are seeing it, or at least people are experiencing it or maybe familiar with it. It is the banking and the global financial market. Of course, there is more and more um, recognition that the blockchain technology can be used and then payment can be, let's say, sent uh, uh, quickly, securely, and cheaply without necessarily being need for a third party verification and so on. One area that is kind of emerging, or it's there as well, that is on the horizon, it is blockchain and identity uh, management. And uh, the good example that we uncovered in the paper was the Estonia digital ID card, where we saw it as a significant advance on uh, what used to be in government fairly siloed identity management. You go in this place, they ask you for this information. You go in the other place, you need to put a different piece of ID. So it's very siloed there. Uh, maybe an open question uh, for you both. What, what, what future do you see for blockchain 
when it comes to that sector, uh, identity uh, management? Uh, maybe starting with uh, Anthony and then going to, to Emil. Yeah, um, I think in government, it's it's huge. The possibility, uh, because of the very problem you pointed to, I mean, we've had this kind of uh, legacy of, of individual departments and agencies that are responsible for different functions in government, essentially managing these independent siloed databases. And every time you interact with a different government agency, you have to go through the, the whole process of proving who you are, your identity. They all have different records. Maybe the, the records might even conflict with one another. Imagine a completely different scenario where all of your critical identity information and your interactions with government was recorded on a very highly secure blockchain. And rather than the government being in charge in, in, of how that information is distributed or released, you have personal control as an individual over that personal identity record. And you can disclose certain aspects of that information as required to different government departments that require that information to process certain transactions, whether that's, you know, getting uh, health care services or social services or, you know, renewing a driver's license. Any kind of uh, interaction you have with the, the public sector could be essentially secured and, and intermediated uh, using this blockchain infrastructure that would give individual citizens much more control over their data and ultimately would be a lot more efficient for government as well because the governments could then do away with having to manage all of these individual uh, implementations of, of different databases with redundant, essentially redundant information about citizens. Again, also dealing with this problem of the, the lack of interoperability between these different systems as well. So I, I think there's a, an enormous use case for these technologies in the public sector. Estonia is certainly one example where they've had the capacity, being a fairly small country, to um, essentially to, to move ahead with putting this kind of digital infrastructure in place for identity management and for citizen services with government. But um, we're starting to see some other examples of this pop up in countries around the world in, in slightly less comprehensive fashion, you know, more in kind of individual isolated examples like the land title um, example that I pointed to. But the potential, no doubt, is is there for for much broader application of this. Thank you. Emil, yeah. anything? Yeah, no, I was just thinking about two points there uh, and, and one that uh, Anthony brought up, uh, and I think it's just you know, decentralizing uh, the, the amount of information and uh, the way people can uh, get these identity cards and so on. It's, it's uh, very helpful for governments in order to free up, uh, I mean, talent and, and, and then use the resources for other things that are um, that can take them forward and, and be more innovative in that sense. Um, and I think it, it, it aligns with uh, going back to some, some research that we've done at Brightline that, that um, kind of pinpoints that high-performing organizations are not only more adaptable, but they're also using leveraging standardized processes. So it helps them to, to, to become more transformative uh, in the way they operate by using standardized processes, or at least leaning back to them and having a more agile um, uh, organization in, in the back. And the second point was, uh, I was thinking about uh, cybersecurity. So, and that's becoming more and more relevant uh, today, uh, where essentially uh, it's going to be impossible, or close to impossible, to to hack this kind of process uh, if it's uh, based on blockchain. Uh, and I think um, I think governments, as as we're moving forward into a more digitized society, then um, it, it's it's uh, blockchain is the most secure option to do this. So uh, I think uh, more and more governments will will start applying the same uh, the same type of uh, structure. Yeah, and there was actually, thank you, Emil, there was actually one comment uh, or one question regarding blockchain and democracy as well. And I know if that with the ID uh, management point, the security, uh, where of course your vote is your vote, someone would not be able to hack it and so on. And then there's that uh, transparency, that trust in the system and so on. Uh, let's move to another question from Juan uh, Miguel Robles. And uh, he's asking a quite relevant question here in the sense that he said, in the experience that we have for companies, how easy is it to use blockchain, whether you are a small size or a large size company? So does size matter? That's the first question. And then he was asking also 
uh, how it goes when it comes to let's say startup and so on. Uh, any any suggestion or answer that you would like to suggest? Is it a, a, a let's say technology that is made? only for smaller or for larger or for both? What do you see the spectrum, uh, Anthony? Um, yeah, I mean, a quick point. I, I think in increasingly, you know, in the past, you know, maybe five years ago, you would say blockchain was more amenable to larger organizations that had more sophisticated IT departments and so forth. I think increasingly that's less and less the case because we have um, – new platforms emerging that make blockchain application development extremely user uh, uh, friendly and, and easier for smaller organizations and startups to manage. So you've got things like the Cosmos ecosystem, the Polkadot system, for instance, which um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you could almost compare it to the way that people used to develop websites. You used to have to hire a whole web development team to build a website. And now you've got all of these amazingly simple applications where you can build a website in 10 minutes. Well, it's kind of increasingly becoming like that with blockchain where you've got this application infrastructure where you can start to build blockchain-based applications just using fairly simple code and, and tools without having to get into the nitty-gritty mechanics and, and uh, extremely sophisticated cryptography and all that stuff. It's all essentially enabled as a service. So, yeah, I think it's increasingly accessible to small organizations as well. Excellent. Are you seeing anything different, Emil, or converging and we can go to the next one? Uh, no, I think Anthony answered it in full. Yeah. Excellent. So, I mean, of course, time is is rush, rushing here, and I have there are many questions. We have, we got 14 questions. This, this explains the, the excitement. Mm -hmm. So let's take one more. Uh, the, 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 this one is coming from Javier, and um, Javier is saying, as we know, there is a perception uh, behind Bitcoins as an underground financial uh, system for hackers or maybe drug dealers, etc. What do we do to implement a formal and trusted blockchain project? I suspect because sometimes you see in the news, I mean, this is being cracked or so on, and it's supposed to be secure. And so do you see anything in that space or... How do we give a comfort that is required there? Yeah, I, I mean, I admit that that has been uh, an issue over the years. We've often, in so many different scenarios, had to, to go to great lengths to try to decouple, essentially, the Bitcoin story from the blockchain story, because I, I do think that Bitcoin over the years and other cryptocurrencies have um, no doubt been a powerful use case for blockchain technology, but... Uh, you know, for various reasons, you know, there have been some issues with cryptocurrencies um, and, and uh, your uh, your colleague has, has pointed to some of those concerns. But I, I think that what we've tried to do through our, our research is show all of the other applications in all of these different sectors, many of which I pointed to today in which you see very powerful uh, benefits from deploying this technology to increase productivity and transparency and efficiency and collaboration and security and privacy where, you know, to me, increasingly, the more that we can tell that story and point to these use cases and show the benefits, you know, the more confidence we can instill in the senior management teams about the importance of this technology. So I, I just think that we have to uh, decouple those, those two stories a little bit and, and just be, um, really laser focused on on uh, just trying to point out the positive use cases in the applications. And, and I think also, you know, when you're looking at the enterprise applications, this is the second point I would make, is that you can um, build in increased levels of security, uh, you know, that might be not be available in a public blockchain environment. You know, so you can limit the amount of people who have access, for instance, you know, which is a these kind of more permissioned or managed blockchain ecosystems, I think, are a little bit different from the public blockchains that are used for cryptocurrency. And, and if anything, can be even more secure than the, the public blockchains. So that's another consideration to, to build into this uh, question as well. Excellent. I mean, Emil, Anthony, thank you so much uh, for this uh, great insight. There are more questions that the time allows us to answer. So. Uh, I mean, for people who ask the question, we'll take a look and see if there is a way of uh, addressing them uh, offline. But really, really appreciate it. 
And uh, one thing that I will add is the research is available on uh, the website. So, I mean, uh, people can get more information and even more excitement when you look at the ability to combine, I mean, blockchain, Internet of Things. And also if you add the uh, quantum computing, there, there are great things uh, on the horizon. Really, really appreciate uh, uh, the insight that you shared today.